So, thank you all for watching. If you are watching this live, well, thank you for being here. Feel free to ask any questions uh, about what we are doing, and hopefully I can clarify as much as I can. But what we're going to be doing today is keep working on the, on the application we started last Friday, which is this six application that I called, which helps the idea is to help you kill applications uh, much faster than doing it manually in some scenarios. And as I explained last week, for the stream, I'm basically following like a step-of-step -step process. So in reality, like the UX and that um, the, the application should do quite a lot more, but we're going slowly and building some concepts around the point-free composable architecture because this application is just an example. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the best example, probably an iOS app, it's, it's easier to show some of this stuff, but I wanted to use a Mac application also to show you that there is nothing to be afraid. Uh, with Swift UI, it's quite easy. It's quite easy to build at least this kind of Mac application, you know, which doesn't have to be like super production ready to, to make it cost like 50 bucks. You know, like if you're making tools, like you feel, should feel free to use yeah, Swift UI for Mac OS because it's, it's quite cool actually. So we're using this application uh, again, as a step-by-step -step process to showcase a little bit of the of the point-free architecture. I was actually checking the commits because since last time, of course, they, they keep working. The repo is still private. It's not open source. Uh, they are actually like finishing some stuff and they plan to release it like, like really soon. I'm not sure, like, but in the following days, probably. So since last time I opened the project, the, there has been some changes that I had to fix quickly before, before clicking the live button, but everything should be working now. And if there is something that has changed and I'm not realizing, well, we're gonna, we're gonna fight through it together and hopefully we can get to the other end. And so, First of all, I'm going to do a recap of the situation we left last week. Last week we had some issues with uh, with upload speed. At the end of the day, I figured out what was the problem. The upload speed was crap for some reason. The download was perfectly fine. That's why I didn't realize that there was a problem on my connection. So sorry for that. Hopefully today it's fine. Like it, the upload now seems correct. So hopefully everything is fine. So I'm going to do a recap uh, to make sure that we are on the same page from what we left uh, last week. The, that stream is not uploaded on my YouTube channel, on YouTube, on, on YouTube, you can find it there. The issue is that because it's taken from Twitch, I'm not sure it has everything that I thought I covered. So we're going to do a quick recap. And after that, I have a, a list of things that I want to show you, but hopefully uh, I'm awake enough to, to actually call them live here and, and hopefully everything works. And there are a couple of things that I'm especially keen on showing you because it, it basically showcases the cool thing about this architecture. And it actually, like the first, at least for me, the first time I saw it, I was like, wow, yeah, that's, that's a huge difference from what I'm used to. So hopefully, like, I can show you these things and you can actually get a little excited about it. Uh, again, the stream is going to be uploaded on YouTube later. So if you want to go and pause and actually check some of the code that it's on the screen. Uh, maybe when the when they release the architecture, like you can actually check and compare what we have done. But like for now, let's let's just get started. Let's start with the recap. If you have any questions, of course, feel free to feel free to ask on the chat. So last week we left it here on the what I call the kill apps screen. If I force Xcode to wake up, we're gonna see that we have like a, a preview here on the on the right. And basically, this screen it's uh, it's mainly some header because, as I said, this like this screen should have should let you set up different uh, scenes so you can basically oh I'm done with work I can kill the scene about work and all the work related applications go away or or like. I stop playing and all the like gaming related uh, applications go away. So like that's the end goal of the application. Like that's still far away because again we're building a step by step. So mainly we have uh, 
a list of the currently running applications on my computer. And I'm pretty sure that's something you didn't see last time. But you can see, uh, probably let me, let me comment this one second, because I think last time what you saw was this, uh, before the internet uh, said goodbye. So we have a list of the currently running applications. And then we have a button for now here at the end that basically it's supposed to kill the current scene. But again, like the scene stuff, it's not, it's not implemented yet. Uh, hello, thank you for thank you for watching. And what we did is we set up basically with the composable architecture we have a state. So the state represents what like everything, all the state on your application. Like you can the nice thing about the composable architecture as opposed to other Redux like systems that are out there is that you can actually break this state into different modules. You can make different packages, different parts of the application are completely independent from each other. So, and then the architecture has systems to pull down, to pull back all of that into like the whole application state, which is a really, really, really nice way of, of building uh, features. For now though, we only have one, we have the screen that we're seeing. So we have the state for the screen, which is basically just the list of applications that we have open. And then we have the actions, because the idea is that you don't modify the state directly, you just give a specific actions that the user has triggered into the architecture, and the architecture basically runs your reducer, which, as we said last week, the reducer is basically just a pure function that it receives a state and the action, and it should just modify the action, the, like the, the state, based on that action. That's why we have a switch statement here. Like, for example, here, when I receive all the applications, I basically set the application to the state, and that's it. So, like, all your business logic, all the modification about the state of your application, that's where it goes. Again, not the application, the state of your feature. Because remember, we can compose them and all that stuff. So when you're making a screen, if you consider a screen a feature, you can just make sure that this is properly working and that's it. And you make sure that your feature, it's everything here, the state, it's not meshed in different methods and classes and all that stuff. That's, it simplifies a lot, like the, the organization of, of it. But then of course, the reality is that there is a world out there, there is a world out there that it's, it's, it's not really nice because it's not pure, it's not functional. And, and that gets messy real quick. So the idea is that the reducer is always pure, but if you want to touch things on that, on that external world, what you do is you return an effect. So that's what we were doing here. Basically what we're doing here is with Swift UI, we say when the screen appears, Let's send uh, an event on the view, on the, on the store, sorry, telling the store that, yeah, the screen has appeared. And then the store on appear, as you can see, like it doesn't, it doesn't touch the, the applications. I'm not reaching to the external world and, and getting the applications from there or anything like that. What I'm doing instead is I'm, I'm giving to the architect that I'm returning an effect. And that effect comes from my environment, which is like, a, you can think of like a sort of dependence injection, but much more structure, which is really nice because you know where to find things very easily. And you can actually compose them and all that stuff. Like the composition on this, on this architecture is key. So what you're getting is, I'm accessing my, my environment workspace, which is this, uh, this app kit, I think, or like, or this Coco class that lets you access your macOS things like the windows and the applications that are open, all that, all that stuff. And I'm getting an effect, which you can think of an effect like as a, like if you're using combine or, or Rx, it's like an observable, a stream of data, like these kind of concepts, like a promise, all these asynchronous stuff. So an effect kind of represents that, a bunch of work that needs to happen on the real world outside this pure reducer. And that effect, if we can look here at the workspace, for example, you can see that the only thing I'm doing is I'm getting the running, the running applications from, from the NS workspace. And then, because that's some specific uh, NS running application class, I want to map that into my own app struct that I control and I can just take the, the, the properties that I want. So I'm just mapping that and returning it as this effect. That's the only thing this effect does. This effect is actually not, uh, it's not asynchronous. It does not hitting an API request or anything like that. 
but because we have it as an external dependency on the environment, it will be quite easy, like, and this illustrates that, that purpose that I wanted to show you, that this is where you will make your API request or whatever you need or touching your database, whatever you need. And it's outside of your reducer, you know, like this is a dependency, an external dependency that, that you need to deal with. And thanks to the environment and thanks to the effects, we will see later how easy is it is to, to test it and to, to take control of those dependencies. So basically that's what we're using here. And then the thing what we are, that we are doing is because the reducer, what you return here, there we go, what we return here, it's an effect, but it's an effect of a specific type. It needs to be an effect that returns an action of the type of your feature. In this case, this kill apps action. When you think about it, it, it completely makes sense because you are on this reducer doing your work and you are giving something to the architecture so the architecture executes it. It's like an interpreter. You give it an, you give it an order and it will execute it. But when that executed, you need some information to go back to you, to go back into this reducer, into, into the, the world you control. And that can only happen with an action. So in the same way that we have an action for on a beer, that it's a user action, or we're going to add one here to, to kill the applications, we have an action to let this, uh, this effect, this external world, send an action into our store so we get that information from there. So that keeps the, keeps the cycle complete, and that's how we get external information into our state keeping it under control and keeping it pure and, and all that fancy stuff, okay? So that's what we left last time. And I don't think you got to see this working, but actually you can now see it, if I run it again, we start with an initial state of just two applications that I made up, Xcode and Slack. But as soon as it gets into the screen, the, the, like the system starts, like you receive an on appear because it's, it's called from here. And then I tell to the architecture, okay, get me the, the all applications. And then the all applications gets feedback into the reducer again, in this case, with the applications. And that's what you see on the screen. There is a lot of them. And we probably should clean it up because if I try to run it, the, the window it's too big. So let's just quickly do like some uh, cleanup in there. But if you want, like, tell me if you understood that part. This was basically a recap from, from last week. But it will be good that we are on the same page before we start. And again, I don't pretend that you understand the whole thing because for some reason, the, like, the point three guys have done like, uh, a lot, a lot, a lot of videos about this. So, and they are writing a book and all that stuff. So like, it's not a, a thing you can understand in five minutes. But if you have any questions that I can solve, Feel free to ask them. So now if I resume, as soon as it gets on the screen, it's gonna it's gonna run the the effect and it's gonna get them. But I'm just getting the like the first five applications to not make it too too complicated. Of course, we can put some logic here and, and that stuff. <clears throat> I think that it's a recap of where we were. And one thing you, we can do, it's um, to await this problem, actually, let, let's try to just get all of it. Because this dependency, this workspace dependency, we actually create a, a live dependency that it's, well, well, like the live one, the one that it's actually using the proper API. But uh, nobody is stopping us in making uh, static let a mock version of this dependency that creates the same effect and, and all that stuff. But instead, what we can do is we can go here and take these two, take these two applications, and basically we can just pass them here on the success. So now we have uh, basically now we just mock a dependency. That's everything we've done. Like it, it's just that it's part of this, this workspace for organization purposes. And now what we need to do is when we create the, the preview, we need to create an environment that uses the mock workspace. 
And now just with that, we're gonna see how even if this reloads, it's gonna keep being like the same applications because those are the applications that we move. If we actually just say that Xcode is open, when this refreshes, we should still see both of them because they that's the ones that, that come from the mock. So that's a little example of how can we we mock easily like all the dependencies and all the data on the on our application, which is it typically it's always been useful to do that for mocks. Although it's a little bit cumbersome, depends on, on how you do things. But like nowadays it's even more important because you are like 90% of your time it's working with the previews. So you don't really want to be hitting real APIs or, or have to complicate your life just to have a simple mock for the preview. So th this shows you how, how nice it is to, to use this architecture and this environment system to get a mock, not only for test, but also for, for the previews. So, the next thing we can do is instead of having this button, which it's what we need at the end, but for the things I want to show you, I think it's going to be better if we change a little bit this. And instead, we make a, a button with an action. Basically, we make each application uh, a button. And then that when the button is click, we can kill that application. Okay, that's it's not the eventual functionality that we want, but it's gonna help us showcase showcase something. So again, for that, you cannot just access your store, which is where your data is, and access, I don't know, your applications and remove the applications. You cannot do that. That's like the, the state that you access through the store, it's not, it's not writable. You can only read from it. So the architecture is protecting you from spreading this business logic everywhere, which then you cannot test and it's super hard to maintain and all that stuff. So what we said we need, what we need is to tell the store that something happened. So for that, we always need to go here and have an action. So which action can we have? Let's say we just kill an application. So we have a new, a new case for the enum of the actions and immediately Swift is gonna tell us that there is some action that we're not handling. So we can just do that and we receive uh, the application here. And now here we could, again, through the environment, we should use the, the macOS APIs to kill an application. But for now, let's just put a break here just to satisfy the, comp the compiler, in s but without actually implementing it. Because first, I want to show you what we need to do. So on the button, when you click the action, well, you need to go through the, through the view store, which again is basically the object it's like that keeps the architecture all together, your reducer, your state, your action, the environment, like it puts everything together. And here you need to send an action. And the action, what it is, like it's the one we just created. Kill, and you can pass an app. And in this case, it's, it's quite nice and simple because we have the app from here. So that, that, that's basically everything we need. But of course, what's going on here? Yeah, it's not self, it's just a view store because that's uh, basically injected here. And if we tell Xcode to run again, please, build succeeded, that's good. And we see that working, okay. okay. But of course, nothing is gonna happen. So we could run the app and take the button and see how things disappear and, and that kind of stuff. But what if instead we use unit testing? What if instead we write a test to exercise this functionality and, and actually see that it works without, without running the application at all? And it's just an excuse to show you how tests works because I think it makes tests really nice to write, to be honest. I'm, I'm quite excited about this way of testing. So we just have uh, this testing that, to be honest, I think I can get rid of all of this. And the first thing that you want is to import 
the composable architecture test support because that's going to give us uh, like some tooling to test our our functionality in a very 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 nice thing. So let's just use this test example for now. Nothing. We don't need anything else. Okay. And remember that we have the we have the mock already. We have the mock here. If if you want, you can you can move this into your test file. For example, that's like something that. We often do, we put our mocks on, on the test target. But I actually like to keep it on, on the normal like production target. Although I usually put it with an if debug to not ship it on production. But I want to keep it on this target because that allows me to use it on the previews. So I can use the same mocks for having nice previews, but also for, for the testing, which I think it, it makes it really nice and easy and you don't have to start duplicating fake data everywhere. So that, that's a nice tip for you. So then what we need is what we want to test is the logic and the reducers and that we send the actions, things happen, all that stuff. And for that, we need the store, okay? But the store that we are going to create, it's not the same store that you create when you are basically in production code. We're going to create a test store. And the test store has a very similar initializer, okay? So there is nothing too different here. We have the, the initial state, <clears throat> which for this case, let's say that we want the kill apps state, and that needs a, a list of applications, which we can just lift empty for this test. The reducer, we want the, the production one, the production kill apps reducer. There you have it. In terms of the environment, because we're running test, we want to use the mock environment. So that's quite simple. We already have done that for the, for the previews. So we can just create an environment here with, that is using a mock workspace. Okay. And I think we can ignore this. And now we should have the store. Uh, the workspace has no member mock. Are you sure about that? Let's see if compiling. Yes, perfect, cool. In, yeah. So now we have our store, and now we want to test something. What do we want to test? For example, well, the that when I start, well, there is no applications. So to have applications, the screen needs to appear. And when it appears, it needs to load some applications. Which ones? The ones from the mock. And then after that, I can click on kill one of the applications. And that should, and that should do something on the store. So we can test all of that. And the way you do that, it's, it's quite simple and quite nice. So the store has this assert. What has and it, the parameter is basically a, a variadic uh, steps, so that helps a lot in in making visually appealing your test, which I think it's something important. So what we said we have to do well, the first thing we need to do is we need to we say okay, so the the this feature starts and gets on the screen, so we can send to the store that the feature appeared, okay, and we can test that. And if we run this, we immediately see the this testing functionality like already telling us very interesting things. So what is happening is it's telling us that we received an unexpected action. So that's already like just with this, it's already giving you so much things. Like you're writing a test and your expectation is not complete because you are not telling the test that well when when we receive an unappear this on on appear it's actually giving you an effect to go to the to the environment and get the the applications so your test is actually it's actually it's actually wrong you know because wait or something is wrong here because your production code is doing one thing and your test is not telling me that's happening so like in this case, 
this kind of test is it's not 100% feature-proof, but it's way, way, way much better than just doing a search individually on a specific things. So to do this, what we need to actually do is we need to tell the system that I'm expecting to receive an action. Which action am I expecting to receive? Well, I'm expecting to receive the all application actions, as you can see here, with which, uh, which applications. We can use, for example, the workspace mock. Uh, uh, let me just get it from here. So which applications I'm going to receive? Well, I'm going to receive these two applications. Whoops, I don't know what I copy there. Okay, so now we have improved our test. We have given more information and we are, we are having more things tested for free. So we are sending on a peer and then we expect to receive this event with this specific data from the event. So imagine this is an API request, so you can actually say, no, I'm expecting this specific thing from the, from the mock API. And we run it again to see what's going to tell us. But it's failing again. And why? Because we said, yes, I'm receiving this data. But we're not saying what's the expected output from the mutation with that data, with this action. So this is telling us that the state has changed. And that now on the state, we have new applications. But we are not asserting on that. So again, or our test is it's wrong because we are not giving the information of the current state that the, the application should be in, or our production code is wrong and we are actually doing things that we shouldn't be doing. So again, the tests have our back again. So how do you actually assert that uh, the state is the way you expect it? So to do that, you can open a closure here on the receive and you get basically a copy of the state that you can actually say, you can actually mutate on, on the flight, and then this, the, this helper is, very, is basically going to check that the, the expected state, which is what you're specifying here, matches what, what the result is. So again, you, you, got, you can extract this in a variable and stuff like that, but let's just copy paste it for now, just for simplicity. And we can run the test again. So what we're saying, when I receive an appear, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expect to receive an all applications after that with these applications. And that what it's going to do. It's going to mutate my state with these new applications that I received. So we have the whole cycle fully tested now. And if we go, for example, and, we've, and we say, you know what? On a beer, I don't actually do anything because whatever, because I'm drunk today and I, and I want to break my application to get fired. So that's fine because when you make the VR, you are going to have the test ready and checking it. Maybe I'm not the only one that, that finds this amazing, but to be honest, like this way of testing and having so much control and just basically writing down the steps to reproduce the test in such an easy and understandable way, I think like there is nothing that gets close to it, uh, to be honest. Like you can, and it's not a critique on, on exit test. Per se. It's like it's not a problem with the testing framework. It's like even if you use whatever quick or nimble or whatever you want to use, like it does, like the problem is not the syntax. The problem is here you are actually interacting with the real store, like the re your real code, and you are telling what needs to happen and what the state needs to be in on each step, which is it's mind blowing. So, but we can continue. It's like okay, now I know in which state I am. Like I know I have applications with these two. So let's test this new, this new functionality we added, which is we can tell to the store that I want to kill basically this application. And let's run again. And here everything should be fine because that's basically what we're doing. We, are, we haven't implemented anything here. And we are returning none, so like everything matches in both sides of the coin. So now let's just for the sake of it, let's try to, for example, uh, let's try to, for example, just remove it from the the array of applications. Like before we go when we implement the environment and when we touch all of that, let's just try to do that first. So for that, we because we are just modifying the state, 
we can actually reach into the state and we can remove mm -mm -mm, remove all where let's say the name matches so basically we are removing that application okay and I guess in theory that's that should be enough, right? So if I run this test now, I should get a failure. And the failures are so nice that it's gonna actually tell me what's the difference on the state. So yeah, as you can see, like Xcode has been removed from the state. So like actually can exercise the tests and the tests tell me what I have to write to follow the production code, which I find it, I mean, quite nice because now you just need to do this and in this case it doesn't make sense but there is some cases where your state is more complex or you're doing more complex uh, like algorithms or, or some something more complex and you actually it's really nice that you can just run the test and the test is going to tell you, you know this is what I have but I'm expecting this to, to be to go away so that's that's quite nice so what happened here yeah of course we remove text code so the one we are uh, still having is slack. Makes sense. Cool. So that's basically what I wanted to show you in terms of in terms of testing. So I don't know if you have any feedback about this or, or what you think about it, but in my opinion like having like you can just see that this is the test. You know? Uh, yeah, like we are mocking the environment, but it's really clear, which is the difference with uh, with many other architectures, that you kind of need to enforce the dependencies in a in a more unstructured way. It's like you or you can go like fully dependency injection systems that do a lot of magic behind the scenes, or you can say okay, like every dependency needs to be in, in the initializer, but then some how you need to enforce that. Instead here, the, the architecture itself, it's telling you, yes, if you have dependency, it goes into the environment. If you, if you want to mock this, that's how you do it. The tests are already, already thought in a way that you can easily mock it. Like you don't have to be like doing crazy things or, or subclassing or using protocols for the sake of just testing, which is something I'm not, I'm not really fan of. I know like... Like there was some conversation on Swift on the Swift forums the other day, because somebody wanted to 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 propose that when you use a testable, that final classes become like subclassable just for the test. And um, basically, some people freaked out about that, and it's like, yeah, I can understand. Like, yeah, honestly, just making protocols for the sake of tests, uh, it's nice in theory, but it's it's just too dogmatic for me. Like, I don't I don't see the point in that. And, and this is different because this is just part of the architecture. It's, it's what you do, you know, like you want to have this pure and the, uh, and the side effects, you, you return effects to, to the side effects or you use the environment to get access to the, to the outside world, you know. And if you are thinking, well, uh, nobody's stopping you to put stuff on the, or on the state, it's like, yeah, fair enough, but one small thing that you can do is like if you make this equitable, which you actually need to make all of this work, uh, that already tells you, it kind of enforces you this idea that the state is a struct, which is pure data, and it's equitable. Imagine that you want to put here, like, I don't know, like the core location manager. Good luck making that equitable. So the compiler is going to tell you, like, no, this shouldn't be here. Like, this needs to be a struct that it's equitable, or you need to implement it yourself. And at that point, it's like you realize, okay, yeah, that's dependency, it shouldn't be here. So then, because you don't have an object, uh, like a view model or a view controller or stuff like that, it's nothing that you can put it, like data in. The only thing you have is like this function. So if you want to introduce something, it's quite clear to see, ah, that's the state of my application, so it goes on the state. Or, ah, this is, an, this is a dependency, so it goes in the environment. So it's really easy when you start using this. Like, it, it makes it, it, it basically gets rid of a lot of questions that you have on your day-to-day -day development. Even more, we're not using it here, but there is a way to create a reducer that basically doesn't have this environment at all. And, 
and they call it like a strict reducer, but that helps uh, avoiding the temptation of putting things on the environment and actually using them directly here without making effects and that kind of stuff. So the whole point here is that the architecture is actually opinionated and it puts your mindset in the way that you're not gonna shoot yourself on the foot and, and that you're gonna get benefits straight away, not some the, like, theoretical benefits because people on the 80s write a lot of books about OB. No. Like what we want here is like benefits straight away. And for me this is already like one of the huge huge benefits. Like that like I cannot question this. And unless somebody has uh, objections about it, I'm gonna say that that's the that's the end of talking about tests. And that's the first thing I wanted to show you to kind of like a little a little mind blown about how nice the tests are. Okay, so that's that's the first part. Any questions before we move on, guys? And goals? So let's let's proceed with the next thing I wanted to show you. So imagine this case. And you wrote your application, okay, and something, or you basically, you got a ticket from somebody on the team and you are so such a nice person that you want to help, to help him because, well, the spring is ending and we need to help each other. So you go and you take a ticket, you don't have, like, a real idea of what's going on, but you are trying to, to debug it and fix it and stuff like that. So, of course. The first thing is like, well, like it's quite easy because you just put the breakpoint here and you go and reproduce the bug and you actually see the action that you're receiving. So, I mean, you just need to see if we're handling the action, if this piece of code is correct, and that's it. That's the first part that already makes such a simple thing like fixing just a, a, a state change. Like imagine you had this on the view controller, on the view model, you need to go through the UI, see what this is called, maybe it's called from multiple places. Maybe the code is spread in different methods because we like small functions and all that stuff. And here is like, well, literally you have the action, so you put a breakpoint here and you know exactly where it is and, and you can see if the issue is here because we are using applications instead of something else, whatever. But of course that's like, in practice, nothing is that nice, okay? Like, let's let's be honest here, like, uh, this is a small example, so it's, it will be easy to understand, but in practice, things are trickier. But still, what is gonna be the problem? I mean, if it's not in your mutation of the state, it's probably just on the, on the effect you're making. So you already know, like, you can go on the effect and check what's going on. You know, so maybe, oh yeah, somebody commented the prefix, yeah? Uh, I don't know who, but very bad. So, it's not that it's like the panacea and like it fixes everything and you're not gonna have uh, debug issues anymore, but it makes it really, really, really easy compared with other ways of structuring code. But even what if you say, okay, yeah, but like I don't want to go with breakpoints because I need to do a lot of things. I want to see, you know, I want to basically see when I do this on the UI, what actions I'm, I'm receiving because this view is quite, Quite simple, but imagine that we have modularized the views and there are multiple view sending events, and I don't know which one is the one that has issues. Like you can make your setup. Well, one nice thing about following these functional ideas of, especially with the reducer, which is basically, as you can see, it's just it's just a function. I mean, we have a type, but that's basically how the API eats to to make it nicer to use. But at the end of the day, like you need to think of reducer as a, as a pure function, and that's it. Well, one nice thing that this gives you is that you can introduce the concept of like higher order reducers, which are uh, reducers that are not from your business logic code, but that give you functionality that you can just apply on every reducer that you have. Okay, so the like as a, like one of good example of this is on the architecture. There is a higher order reducer, which I think it's called the debug. And there is debug actions and, and many like different variations of the same idea. But this debug, what it does is it basically hooks into your reducer 
So basically, your your like your feature reducer, the the one that has your business logic, and it basically will print all the messages that it receives, all the actions that it receives. So we can showcase this quite easily by just running the running the application. And if we see, like, just by opening the application, because we have the we have the onload, we already see that the application has started and it received an action. Okay, so the action it received, like we can see that it's uh, we received the all applications, and then we like we we added the. Like there was a, a state mutation with a slack, and we also see that when when we started, we we received the unappear and all that stuff. So I I don't know exactly what this application is doing, but I don't, I haven't read the code yet. But I can go here and say, oh, what if I click six? Oh, well, there is no action, so probably somebody forgot like of hooking up this up to to the receiver. Yeah, and that that's. That's exactly like the problem because, as you remember, we didn't put any action here. Okay, but like, what if I do this? Oh, okay. So I saw that this is a kill. This is a kill action. Okay, so I can go to the to my reducer and see what it's doing for the kill. Ah, so I'm just removing the application with the same name. Yeah, and that's what's happening. So you can see like this is just a, this is just a, a use case, but I think it's a quite nice use case that when you are kind of lost and I've, I've done this a lot on the on the composer architecture example because they have so many examples like they are doing a great job of documenting and giving examples for all the functionalities uh, it's quite like hard to follow like the one of the most complex examples so I just drop a debug and sometimes it's even there already and I can just go here and click and see what's happening and it's like okay I see what's happening and, and then I can go to reduce and understand it better without having to look at the UI code because I don't really care about that. So that's another example of the benefits that you get for free while using this architecture and again why you get these benefits? Well because the simple concepts that you are forced to follow with this architecture, which is your state is here, the changes on the state are executed by throwing actions into your reducer, so your business logic is on your reducer and only there, and then if you want to do external external things, you use the environment and you use the DFX. So just because we're following this, this unlocks a lot of potential, and like we have seen how the tests are really nice, and we have seen how just inspecting the actions that happen on your on your user on your application, it's actually super easy to do thanks to just to just the the debug reducer. And I don't want you to think that this is something special that the that the library authors have done. Like if you look at it, uh, if you get deep inside, you can see that it's just a reducer. The same thing we write. You receive a state, you receive an action, you receive the environment. They are doing uh, like some stuff here, like to call your reducer and get the effects and, and make sure they don't break anything. But at the end of the day, they just made the reducer. So if you have an idea of something that it's like, like this, a higher order reducer, something useful that it will benefit a lot of different reducers, because they are just functions, you can just make it and, and pass a function in, in this case of the user. So it's in the same way that we all like to use map on arrays or or filter or reduce because they have this functionality that we can just reuse over and over passing a function to modify the parts that we want. That's exactly the same idea here. Like you have your custom thing that you pass into the map to, to, to get the specific data, like what we did here. So it's the same idea, but if you think that this is your reducer and actually map is a higher order reducer, that's it. So you can see how a lot of understanding this is basically understanding how functions work, how higher order functions work, and you can apply the same concepts into your architecture. So it's like, well, we are just talking about architecture, but at the end of the day, we're just talking about functions that we all understand what they do. So it's a really nice concept and, and a really nice way of leveling such a hard and different things. 
So that's the second thing I wanted to show you, this simple debug functionality and, and talk a little bit about the higher order users because I think they are exquisite. But now, let's go the extra mile. And that's something that you really can't do in like 90% of the, the applications that, that we write if we follow whatever you want to follow, MVC, MVVM, MVP, Viper, or whatever your mother said today. It doesn't matter. Because none of those architectures have such a simple, uh, a simple way of thinking about the state and the events. Okay. So again, this is what, what I'm going to show you now. I want to just show show it to you to prove you that it's not magic, that it can be done just by getting the benefits of of these simple concepts, which is what the architecture gives us. So what I'm talking about, it's time travel. Okay. So. Imagine that you have a system that you don't have to do anything just because you're using and you're building your app in this nice way. You don't have to do anything at all. And for free, you can actually time travel through the changes on your application. And by that, I mean every time that you do something on your application, that's tracked on a history. And then with some fancy UI, uh, what we're going to do today is just a slider on the, on the application itself. But you can go, but you can go the extra mile and build an external application. And actually, somebody I want to showcase it because it's quite cool. Somebody actually built uh, this Storian, which, as you can see, is like it's an external application on your Mac, and it keeps track of everything that happens on your on your application. But not only that, it's like you can actually click on one of these points in time, and your application goes to that point in time. That's, if that's not mind blowing, uh, I don't know. I don't know what else to do, to be honest. Because honestly, like how many things, how many things that will help with. And I know this is not new. There are like on, on web with Redux, of course, because it's a similar idea. They already do that, and they and it's super nice. So I'm I'm super excited to actually have this available kind of for free into into our world into iOS. Okay, so imagine that QA is doing this, like QA finds a bug and it just clicks a button and instead of sending you, I don't know, the call for the API, because it's always an API problem, of course, but sometimes it's not, okay, maybe 1% of the time it's not, it's actually our problem. So imagine that when that happens, they can just not send you what is useful for the API, but they can actually send you, okay, this is that all the things I did. The step to reproduce, I don't have to write them, just send this. And you just need to load that. And you can actually just click next, 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 and see every change that QA did. And you can actually see where the bug is just by debugging. Oh, man. Oh, man. I want this to be live already because I'm too excited. So uh, we're not going to use this. What I want to prove to you is that this is not magic. What I want to prove to you, and I'm not sure how it's going to go, is that we can code this in whatever time we have uh, for today. We're going to code here live. And if it works, cool. If it doesn't, well, let's cry a little bit together. But that's what we're going to do today. OK? So let's drink a little bit and see how that goes. OK. Where should we start? Where should we start? So I guess the first thing I want, the first thing I want is, as we said, like we need to hire the reducer that can basically hook into the actions that we send to our reducer and, and actually keep track of that and all that stuff. That's gonna be the first part. And for the second part, which I'm not sure if it's gonna be way harder or stupidly simple for what the use case that we have is that we want that when you can go back in time, we just reset the state to that to that basically point in time. So for that, uh, okay, 
Well, let's let's see. Let's let's start coding this. It's not useful to think a lot if you don't know what you're doing. So let's call this time travel because I like it. We could call it Doctor Who, but, uh, but that's too much. So let's say that we want, of course, we want to import the composer architecture and we want to import Swift U. Yeah, because I, I need to interact with Swift UI, I think. Because the idea is that. Yeah, because we need to put the slider. We need to show some UI for the for the line travel. So, so yeah, we need some UI. Okay. So then the next thing it's going to be. Well, let's start by making a, the reducer. So let's do a reducer uh, where. Hmm. I'm thinking if I need to put some constraints. Uh, let's just. Give me a second. Give me a second because I want to make sure that I have the messaging applications closed. Should be all right. Okay. Anyway, so uh, time travel, and this is one of the reasons why a reducer it's put in a in a type instead of just a floating function because you can now extend it and, and make a nice API for it. But again, as I said, just thinking about it, you just need to think about it as a function. That's it. Right? There is nothing else. We need to return a reducer here. And this needs to be a reducer with the... Let's use this snippet. Because I want to write time travel a lot of times. So we're going to have a state... Do I need an action? Well, yeah, because again, because we have UI, we need to have actions when that UI changes. The environment, I don't think we need it. Again, if you are making, for example, Something that communicates with an external application or stuff like that, you don't need an, an environment for this. But for now, let's just pretend we don't need that. And here, yeah, it's a time travel state, the environment, and for, for the environment, well, I guess, I guess the reduce, well, yeah, no, sorry, I'm mistaken. We don't need this reducer because we're making we're making our higher reducer as part of this, so we don't need that. Yeah, okay, makes sense. So yeah, for state, we have this state and we have this travel action, and we have uh, the environment of the reducer we are being called in. Hmm. So yeah, this reducer, uh, like for example, I think the debug reducer, and we can actually check uh, debug. I think, yeah, this one. I think the debug, what is this? No. Producer, I think the debug is here, right? What is it? So I think, the, yeah, this, this debug reducer basically doesn't change the type of your reducer. So it's actually nice because you can put it, uh, if you have a chain of these higher order reducers, you can put it anywhere and it doesn't affect uh, anything else. In our case, uh, as far as I know, I'm not, I don't see a way of avoiding this right now. Maybe, maybe I realize something later. But I think we actually need to change the type of the reducer because we're going to be putting that in our own view. So that's the idea. Uh, so what do we do here? Well, we just create a reducer. Again, uh, as always. And here we're going to have uh, the state, the action, and the environment. And we're going to return an effect. OK, yeah, I think I can get rid of this. And if, if we make a mistake writing this, forget about any help from Xcode, because it freaks out 
Uh, they were supposed to improve this, but I'm not sure there has been much changes, to be honest. But, so that's the reducer we want, okay. Let's for now just fatal error here, because I'm still not sure how we're going to integrate this, so for now let's just tell the compiler to shut up. So, the part I'm not exactly sure how to do is how to integrate it on the on the on the view because what i want what i eventually want is like, let's use the preview as an example so what i want at the end of the day it's kind of like a time travel view and just to make it fancy we can use like the swift ui uh, style and basically that's what i want that's what I want, okay? Now, from what I want to what I can do in live coding, it's, it's a different story. But that's what I want. So, well, let's just start with this. And let's see if we can actually do it. So that's going to be a view. It's going to be a view. So, to have a view, Basically, let's solve one problem first. I want to have the Swift UI kind of DSL. And for that, we need to use function builders, the, like the Swift UI function builders. For that, for that, I'm going to use this because I don't remember exactly how to do them. Do, do, do. Yeah, that's what I want. Okay, so. So I need a view builder. And this view builder is like, you don't have to super understand it. Basically what the trick that Swift UI uses to, to have the nice DSL basically. And I want the escaping function that we give it something and it returns the content, no? Now this something is not gonna be a view store. Hmm. It needs to be the store. Yeah, because we're wrapping the store, so we need, we need to pass the store. Okay, so that means... Well, I need the store for my... for the time travel specific logic. So we can have the state, we can have the action, and the environment... I don't need my own environment, but I will need it for the type system so let's make a generic for that yeah i know chill okay but you want this let's make the compiler shut up okay yeah so we need this environment here Okay, so our view is going to be generic, that, that, that's for sure. But now, we're going to need a lot of more generics, because one generic we need is it's this one. So basically, our child view, which is the real view that, like, that you are using, in our case, this killer app view, uh, needs to be this content, so as in there, basically, content needs to be a view. Okay, so now this is happy. But still, what we need to pass here is a store. And here we need to give you the store that you are expecting. Not the time travel store. We need to give you the store that you are expecting. So for that, we need a lot more, um, basically. We need the state and we need a generic action. And this store is gonna use your state, your action, and your environment. So I'm going to give that to you so you can render. That's fine. Do, 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 do. Say what? Got three, but... Ah, yeah, because the store doesn't need this. Because that's part of the radius, so, yeah. Miscellage requires a one more wall, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. You require a body. So let's say that we actually need the same, like that. 
Is the stream still up? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, that's good. So here we just want to store the content. But now we need the, the store. And for that, let me see. Okay, so basically what we're saying here is that we're going to receive a store. And this store is what we can pass here. That makes sense. But we, I mean, the time travel view needs somehow to have all this to give you the store that you want. Otherwise, we can just pass it. In the initializer of the time travel view, right? It's like you initialize the time travel view with the uh, basically the store and the actions that your own view needs. Uh, yeah, why not? Well, to be honest, let's just copy this. Let's just copy this guy. So the initial state is a state. The initial reducer is uh, well, it's. Basically, the reducer that goes with your state, with your action, and your environment. And the environment is going to be your environment because the time travel doesn't need any. Okay, so now in theory, we can just get this and pass it here. Yeah, we're not creating the store, then the store is being created for you. Cool. Now what? Well, now we need to make this store. The comparison is gonna complain, right? Yeah. Okay, now it's a tricky part. Well, I'm not sure how tricky it's gonna be. Because this store needs to be a time travel. Like a store with the state and actions from the time travel. But for that, I think we can just create a reducer. Not a reducer, sorry. Yeah, I don't know why I didn't write that. We can create the state with the initial state. But I need time travel state. Well, 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 no, yeah, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. Let's, let's, let's break it down to see what we need to do. So first of all, we need, we need a, a store, uh, let's call it child store, with state and action. And that's quite easy to create because we have all the data we need. Uh, why? Oh yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, now we're talking. So yeah, now it matches this with this reducer and this environment. Okay, so yeah. So maybe we can just pass the store here instead of passing each each thing separately. I don't think we need well let's like we can clean that up later. But now that we have this we need to convert this into a time travel store and for that we can use the the reducer uh, because that's already yeah no 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 I'm doing it wrong. I'm doing it wrong. I'm doing it wrong because what I need is actually yeah. I'm 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 being confused by the reducer and the store. That's what's happening. That is what's happening. 
that is what's happening. So the environment, I don't care about the environment, so you will just pass it around. The state, we need to create this state. But of course, that's, yeah, I forgot, yeah, okay. So the state needs to be generic. Child state, let's say. And this needs to be basically, well, I guess we have the current state, which is the child state. So we can say current it's basically what you're giving me here, which is the initial one. Okay, and the reducer now it's one. You use the reducer and you call that time travel to get that reducer. Okay. Yeah, and now this is generic and it needs to be generic over this state. Okay. And to be honest, we will need the same for the action. Oh, you can do this. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you can, but I'm not doing something correct. Yeah. Like it tells you, oh, I cannot resolve this, but it's because there is a drag error somewhere else. So, yeah, it needs to be equatable. Uh, so we can force your child state to be equatable. That's fine. Uh, 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 uh. And now we need to say this state actually needs to be equatable. To so basically, we're putting the pieces of the pipes puzzle together. Do, 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 do. What did you stick on? Yeah, state because it's the local state from here. So we can just do this where state is equal. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. That's cool. Oh, maybe it's not that cool. Is it or not? Tell me. It is? Yes, it is. So we'll stop complaining. Okay, so now we have the time travel store. Now let's try to fill this in. So I, I mean, well, first of all, let's try to just put the, well, to get, to get the child be working, we just need to call self content, but we need to pass the store. And we don't have a store for the child, so we actually need to, to pass something here. So we have the time travel store, and we can, I guess we can, we can what? We can, no, we can scope. Yes. We can scope the state and the app. Is only action? No, I don't know. So basically, what we're doing now is like we have this time travel store, okay? That it's like a global store, but we have a view that needs uh, its own child store because we have a child view. So we need to scope our time travel. Scope is like you just take pieces of the state and pieces of the actions and you give it to the children. So that's what scope does. It's like you have a global that takes care of a lot of things and, and that's this is basically the composition we're talking about. Like imagine that you have multiple features and then you make one store one state that has all of them. When you give when you want to give to the specific view its specific state and its specific actions, you need to scope into that. So that's what we're doing here. And to scope on the on the state, we need to put the state somewhere, which we have. And the actions, we need to do the same. So, so let's say children, child. We need to do the same. I'm just gonna do it now because I know. Okay. Okay. And now we need to do a dance again. So this needs to be action. And action needs to be equal. And it needs to be action. And action needs to be equal. Okay, so now I have something to scope that 
that I because like if I don't have the child action and the child state on my time travel and states and action, there is no way that I can implement in the scope. So it needs to be there one way or the other. So now that I have this, I can time travel state the current, so that's gonna be that that focus in there. And for the actions, which I think it's, I don't know if it's actions or actions. So for that, we also need the time travel action and please use the child. <laughs> okay, I'm creating the view and I'm giving you a store scoped to the current and the child state, which are based on the on these generic types is basically what you need. So that, that, I think that should work. It shouldn't do anything yet, but it should work. Well, except this fatal error is not going to do anything. I mean, that should work, no? I have the feeling that, I mean, we should see the same. Perfect. So I'm excited because it means that we matched all the types. We even use uh, the fancy view builders from SwiftUI, so you can basically nest here whatever you want, like you can do with, with normal SwiftUI. And we just need to actually implement the time travel functionality, which I think that's not gonna be the hard, but we'll see. So the first thing we need to do, as I said before, is keep track of things. And for that, we can make a history here that it's basically going to be an array of child states. And let's start with an empty child state. And then here, it's we need to basically do a kind of similar dance like the debug, uh, the debug reducer does on the on the library, that debug reducer I showed you before. So let's switch on the action, like any normal reducer, basically. And now let's let's implement the the case child action. So now basically we know that this action is for the for for your view, it's not for the time travel because we will need more actions for the time travel. So this action is for the time travel. So we need to call is basically your reducer and your reducer it's self because we're an extension, oops, because we're an extension on self. So we can just call this because it's implementing the new, the new callable types feature on, on Swift 5.2 if I'm not mistaken, I think. So you can actually use that if you are running on Swift 5.2. If you don't know what I'm talking about, there is a video on my YouTube channel about that, and it's quite fun. So now we need to use your actions. I'm going to give you the child action. <clears throat> and the environment is always the same. Like I just keep passing the environment around because for the time travel, the environment is useless. Okay, and now it gives me effects, effects, well, it's actually one effect. Yeah, I know, chill, chill, I still haven't finished. So now, your state is mutated here, so... So I guess I can just get my state, access the history, and append and append state current, right? So basically we're keeping track of the new state in there. Um, and we need to return the effect. So if you want us to do something, we just give it to the Action never to return type. Well, yeah. 
well, no, that makes sense because this effect is from your action domain. I need to convert it into my action domain. So I think there is a, there is a map. And that's quite simple because we need to use this. So when your effect completes, it's going to have an action from your domain. I just need to embed it into my domain, which is basically doing this embedding. And then I'm going to receive it. I'm going to fall into this case. I'm going to extract it and give it back to you. So it's, it's like for you, nothing happened, but I kept track of it. So that's, that's cool. And that's, I think that should work. Uh, I think that should work. And to try this, we can just first show how many states are we keeping are we keeping track of. So for that, let's make some little more fancy UI. No, not on a slider. Slider is gonna be for later. So we can just say I need access to the data, so I need to make with view store. That's a nice thing about the architecture. Like a week ago, the with the this with Viewster was not like well a week and a half or something. Oh, that was not part of the architecture. That was introduced quite recently. But because it makes sense once you understand it, and it's just like like you just need to repeat the same thing over and over. Like these small details, they just like get into your brain, and basically it's kind of mechanical. So what I want is the history. And that should... Okay, so we have two states. Yeah, the initial, and because it loaded on the screen, we... Yeah, we fetched the all applications, and we are showing that. So we mutated the state two times. I remove this, we're mutating the state three times. Okay, so we have three snapshots of our entire application state in memory now. So now we just need to make that you can actually go back in time. Uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. And let me make a quick, a quick run to the bathroom because I'm losing focus. So let's switch to this. Yeah, we are showing the story and we want to put a way to, to go back in time. Okay. So to go back in time, we're going to put a slider, I guess, is this way. I think we could put a like a stepper, like next back, next back, but I just put a slider for now. I think it's 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 faster to be honest. No, I'm not I'm not sure I'm debating. I just want to do whatever it's it's quicker for the stream, you know? And to be honest, I think the stepper on Mac OS it's quite uh ugly, I think by default. So the slider needs a value, and that's already a problem. Because we could uh, keep basically here a state with an index. Well, that's, that's cool, because that shows another thing about the architecture. If you have built a, a slider on, on Swift UI, you basically, you know, you, you, you have, uh, I mean, then you can do a double and you say zero and then you basically you have this state here and that it's internal to your view and and this state is gonna make sure that when it changes it renders the view and all that fancy stuff and then what the slider wants is it wants a binding to to basically to a variable and you get a binding from a state by using basically the property wrapper uh, wrap value and that, that fancy thing and all that stuff. But what's the problem? That that means that your state is no longer on your state as it should be. So if you do this, the architecture doesn't know anything about it. You cannot test it. The like you cannot ensure that you change it from a specific place, and that's bad news. So what we actually need to do is keep this state in in the in our time travel state okay so we need to keep an index here um, and i want to make an index integer so i don't have to deal with conversions at this point 
Mm, and just for the sake of it, let's start a minus one. I mean, this is not super nice, but it's more work. So that's the first thing you need to do. Because you want to keep track of that somewhere. And that somewhere is always your state. The second thing you need to do is, well, when the slider moves, it, it will try to change some data. But we don't change data directly on the Composable architecture. What we do is we actually send an action. So we actually need to put an action that let's call it change index. And we receive, I would say, I mean, in theory, we want an index. But let's just for simplicity say a double, because the slider, at least as far as I know, it uses a double. So that's, that's good. Now we have another case here which is change index and so let's just break for now just so the compiler is happy with that part yeah that's fine and now one of these nice things about having the architecture having your back which is you can use the view store to actually extract a binding uh, to actually extract a binding from the state and from the actions, okay? And let me quickly open, well, I guess I can do, I want to see, I want this, there we go. So the get, we're creating a binding now, it's gonna get where state and we can pass the index. And I think, what? From the clear get? Oh yes, sorry, sorry, sorry. But it wants a double, so let's convert it now because otherwise the errors are gonna be are gonna be insane. And then we need the set. But I don't I don't want yeah, I want the set. That's what I would do. I would read in here, which is the deck like, when we're creating a binding. That's and if you follow me on Twitter, you will like like a while ago, like some weeks ago, maybe months by now. I basically implemented this myself. On, on the Composer architecture, but on the version they have on the episode and the episode sample code. And I didn't know how to call it. <laughs> and I posted a tweet and everybody had a different view of how to call these, these parameters. So yeah, so they, they, at the end of the day, they, they implemented the same functionality, but they gave them, I guess, what makes more sense in terms of naming. And send, I think there are some overloads. Yeah, see, we can just pass an action. So for that, we can use the time travel action, change index, and that's it. Okay. And if I'm not mistaken, the slider, the slider has more, more stuff on the initializer. Yeah, it has tons of things. But it has a view builder for a label, okay. So we can actually do... We can actually put... View store... We can show the current index of... Uh, of the count. But the index is zero based, so that should be that. And this count is plus one, so I think we need to. I'm not sure if I'm doing this right. Don't math in public. But yeah, anyway, we can we can just run it and see how it goes. And I probably want some body. And again, like in if you want to do this as a library, like to ship it and, and to actually make it nice. You will make a nicer view than this and probably like hiding by default that you can just tap on the screen so it's like flex does uh, and then it shows up and stuff like that. But for simplicity and we're just live coding this so I don't want to complicate it, it's already complex. It's not super complex but I'm, it's going well for now but I don't want to, I don't want to, to say that we're gonna finish because maybe I cannot, um, I can figure out the last step. But for now, it's good, so I don't want to complicate it more. So, I don't know why I moved away. I want to see... 
because I want to put a limit, uh, I don't want to put a 0 to 1, I think the Swift UI slider can tell you, can actually have a range, yeah, the bounce, but wasn't that something else? There was a slider. In, yeah, see, that's the one, that's the one. Yeah, I want this one. Okay, so I can just use in and a close range of a floating point, so it needs to be a double. I can just put in here. So you want to go from, I guess, zero, the close range, so I need to use this, and then I need to go from view store. Uh, history count, but that's gonna be an integer, so I need to make that double. Does she compile? It does? Nice. It doesn't. Well, but it's not complaining about here, so that's good. If it complains here, like the errors in Swift UI are still, are still not, not, not that nice. So yeah, I will freak out a little bit. But where is the error? Missing return. Oh, yeah. okay. okay, so basically now we have the view part set up. We are getting a binding from the view store. So basically that's it's really nice because it, it lets you mix the like Swift UI, which needs bindings because it, it basically a UI framework that requires like a two-way bindings, which is something we don't want because we just want to get the data and then feed actions back. It's like a, a unidirectional flow. So it's like two different ways of thinking. But with this view store binding, we make we basically bridge the gap between the two, which is again like super nice to work with. So now we just need to implement this. And that's that's something that probably is tricky. So now we're being told, okay, I want you to go back to this to this basically index, which is a it's a, a state that we get on our history. So first we need to change the index of this, otherwise, otherwise it's gonna complain. Oh yeah, state sorry, because we are gonna be trying to move the slider, and if we don't update the data, it's not gonna be in sync. So that's that's very bad. And we can just use int. Okay. We may be... Like in theory, the slider should go in steps, so we should be fine. But now... Okay, so we have... So we have the history at that index. So that's the basically the snapshot of the state that we want to recover. Well, in theory, isn't it as easy as just saying current equals this? We're changing our current, and because current is what we are giving to our child view, that should work. That should work. Doesn't it? Compiles, let's see. Okay, so we have the this from zero to one. Okay. Well it crashed, but we saw it moving, so that's that's good. Okay, let me review this. Well, yeah, one stupid thing we're not doing is like we need to actually increase the index here because we're automatically like when there is a change, we're going to the next state, so we can we need to keep track of that. The problem is that we're gonna have to fix something here because well, I'm gonna show you in a bit.
Well, yeah. The first problem I saw was that we were saying we were going too far. So that's this. And let me run because I don't know what else. And I think this count is wrong because we actually want the count because we want the total. So yeah. So that doesn't make sense. But I think visually this makes more sense, okay? Now what did it guys? To be honest, I'm already showing you like like the, the time travel implementation was done already. Now we're just messing with indexes that I that I basically did wrong at some point. So we can go back to the initial. There we go. That's how the app starts. And then we load data and we see the data. I don't understand it because why it goes there. That's because the slider, the slider, yeah, it needs to be. We were starting at zero. I mean, I guess we can start at one. No, because the array is zero indexed, so this makes more sense. Yeah, because in the beginning there is... Okay, so let's do... Give me the maximum between 0 and this. Because you cannot reverse ranges in Swift. If you reverse a range, that's the crash at runtime. And this one is wrong because we have two states, so I need to get rid of this. It's funny how the complex things with time travel and all that stuff, it was not that hard to do, and now I'm wasting time just managing index. But now it looks okay. So we added two of two because we loaded from from the environment. We can go back in time and we can go forward. How cool is that, mate? How cool is that? Now we can just keep adding. So now we are here and now we're here, but now we can go back in time. So what? When did we start? At one hour of the stream. What took us 40 minutes to basically implement from scratch time travel for the application. And that's not because I'm too good, that's because the architecture makes it super easy. Super easy. That's that's great. One thing I'm wondering, and now it's like just like making it nicer because for the sake of it, it's if I'm here and I do this, yeah, that's wrong that it's wrong because we are rewriting history so we need to clean that yeah like there is a step that it's in the wrong position and you could implement here a branching system so you could see all the but yeah let's not go crazy although that would be freaking cool but i guess that for now we can just check if so when we're modifying the the when we're modifying the state we need to check if we're actually in one of these time travels, so I guess we can do that with checking the, like if the history count, so if the count is bigger than the index we are in, I guess. And again, maybe minus one because this. And then in theory, oh man. Why is the completion not? Ah, do you think I know from memory the entire array API or collection API? Let's go here. <coughs> Ay, Maria. Ay, salut. Remove subrange with a bounce. So remove subrange. So what do we want? I guess we want state index until the end, no? So the idea is like we receive an event, so we modify it. So before we add it, yes, that's fine. We need to basically remove 
So we're in this index, we need to get rid of all of that. We're not going to be adding a new one. I think that's all right. The two states of every programmer. I know exactly what I'm doing. I have no idea what I'm doing exactly. Like there is no middle ground in there. Or one or the other. And I thought the hard part was the time travel and apparently I did that very quickly and now the indexes and I'm broken. Okay, so boom, three, boom, four. Now let's go back in time. And let's, let's go here and remove this. Boom. And we have only two. And we can, yeah, we lost the other, which is fine. Okay, so that's it. Boom! Boom! New face! Time travel implemented. 40 minutes. Easy. Well, 45. Because I lost time with the indexes. Like, don't take that into account. And again, that's just because the architecture makes it really nice. And it's not the architecture as the specific library, the, li the library is really well done, but the concept, the ideas, the fact that the state, all your state is here, which is makes it like, makes it's super easy, just like this, that I'm keeping the entire state of the application. Like that's the that's the key here. And the fact that I can just recover, which I was not sure if it would work, to be honest. I thought, I don't know, in my mind maybe you wanted to replay the actions or some crazy stuff like that, but no, because it just the state, it's just a struct. You can just set it again. And because the UI is driven by like Swift UI, which it just renders whatever state you give it, and we pass it here again with the current, it just re renders on the screen. Woof! Fancy, fancy, fancy. So again, this basically what? We did it in what? Like less than 100 lines of code, we have time travel. Not the most fancy UI in the world, but it does the, it gets the work, the job done. Okay, that needs to blow your mind, and if you don't, you're lying to me, I don't trust you, unless you come from web, and this is basically your day to day, if that's the case, that's the case, then it's fine, but yeah, so that's kind of basically the things that I want to show you, I wanted to show you uh, the the nice way of writing tests, which we can take a last look with. Basically, you are just describing the steps and the expectations of those steps in this really in this really nice way. And as we shown before, if you don't if you receive effects or events and that kind of stuff, and you don't you forget to specify it, like the test is gonna complain, which is really nice. And then I showed you the debug, which I think it's a really simple but really powerful way of showing how a, how a high order reducer works and just to see what, what events your UI triggers. And then the last thing is like, well, let's expand on the idea of a higher reducer and let's exploit to the fullest the design of the architecture to just build time travel in an easy way. So these are the three things that I wanted to show you. I hope that this has given you like kind of a little bit of excitement or a little interest if, if you are quite accepting on this, on the usefulness of, of this architecture. As I said, the guys from Point3 are, are working on it. Uh, what is the repo? This is the repo. As you can see, like there is activity, like constant activity, people like creating issues, making pull requests, it's actually like a, like a little community that has been formed here, like I think there are like yeah, around nine contributors, but a lot more people it's on the, it's on the, on the issues, giving feedback and, and raising issues and that kind of stuff. So it's a very, very nice community, to be honest, like everybody is, is giving very, very valuable feedback. And, and Brandon and Stephen are actually on it every day, polishing it, like actually answering, helping us because one thing, one thing it's clear is that this is kind of a switch, a mental switch in some aspects. So sometimes like you want to do something and you don't really know how and, 
or, and, and you can do it because doing things is quite easy in this architecture, but personally, I've raised a couple of issues because I wanted to ask, am I doing this right? Or, or I'm just taking a shortcut that I shouldn't be because I don't really understand what I'm doing. You know? Like we were saying, it's one of the two states of every programmer. So people are raising questions like that and they are answering like every day. It's, it's very nice. Hopefully, they, I think they are writing the book and I don't, I don't know what's the plan. That's something you can ask them when the book is going to be released, if they wanted to do it at the same time as the open source library. I have no clue about that. I don't have to, no insight here. I just was invited on this repo and I love it so much that I'm spending two hours on my Friday evening just streaming for all of you. So I'm not, apart from a couple of comments that I did, <laughs> I cannot take any credit from this. So I don't want people to think that it has anything to do with me. And if you want to give this some love, uh, keep an eye on their Twitter account or, or in mine, to be honest, because I'm, of course I'm going to be tweeting about this when, when it's released. So if you want to follow them directly, I think it's point free. I think it's easy like that. Yeah, there you go. At point free, point free, co. Cool. So that's the Twitter you can follow. Probably they're going to be giving some news. If you are curious, you can actually have, uh, which somebody asked me if I was going to show, if I was going to do this stream showing their, their demo applications. And my answer was no, because I see that they are using it like kind of like for some marketing thing, like to, to hype a little bit people. And I love that. So I don't want to basically destroy their marketing strategy by showing things that they don't want to be shown. Okay. I asked permission to show and to use the library, but I didn't, I didn't specifically ask about, about the, the demos. But you can see how in this case, this is a, a voice memo application which shows you that this is not just a toy architecture. Like this is like, you can interact with complex APIs, like the voice recording APIs and all that stuff. And you can see how the state it's, it's bigger. You can keep the, you can keep the different voice memos here. You can play a stop, which means that you can cancel the effects and, and keep track of what's running and all that stuff. Like it's not a toy architecture, maybe, of course, what, I, what we have done doesn't show everything, but it's not a toy architecture like us. Like you can grow it, and it's the whole point of it that it's a composable architecture. Like you can compose it and keep growing it at infinitum. So, so that's that's the thing. This is basically showing the debugger, the debugger that I was showing. I think they have something else. Yeah, the speech framework. This is another one. I'm sure you're gonna hear it. You can see how they are playing the video and at the same time the phone is recording what they are saying and basically converting the voice to text. So again, that's not a toy application, like, I mean, it's a simple application because it's for an example, but the APIs and the way it's working, it's not a simple thing. It's actually interacting with, with complex uh, uh, dependencies, you know, so don't feel like this is just a toy because it's not. I'm not sure if they show any other one. Well, I did, this is just the case, the use cases, right? This is probably the most useful thing I've seen from some, some open source library like this. This is literally a list of show of, of case studies that show you, I mean, the Twitter resolution is it's kind of crap. To you. I don't know if you there you go. It shows you Case studies for things that, like it helps you know how to do specific things with the architecture, okay? Like from navigation and loading data when the screen is open, like they have a lot of combinations here, like you freeze load the data and then navigate, or you navigate and then you load the data, uh, screens that are only displayed when the data is available. There is a lot of these things like how to work with timers or long living effects, like what, we're, what we were basically showing before with the re voice recording and all that stuff. Uh, so the effect that I showed you today, uh, which we did the other day, is basically a super simple effect. It's basically a, a one-off. Like you don't have to keep track of it or anything like that, but 
this like they have examples for all of that okay uh what else they have here yeah so this one i haven't shown this but this one it's 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 one of the most amazing features of this what this what they are showing here is that you can create a component and a component in in this sense means you can create uh i need to buy a webcam you can create a state actions a reducer an environment and a view and all of this you can make it you can make it in a way that you can just wrap your own business logic components in this one and you for free get functionality like from that component for free and again it's super composable like in this case what they have done is they have made this download component okay that it basically knows how to download something and then you can just basically use it anywhere you want i actually i actually uh, i can try to show you i'm not sure if it's gonna be compiling or not let's let's take a look because they have an example that i modified to make it basically more complex so i probably can show you uh but that was probably let me take a look because they had an example with uh like a favoriting system so you can basically favorite anything just by adopting this component and and the thing that i found annoying was that the like the example was just favoriting one thing? Mm, I think I need to change the branch. So what I did was basically I implemented uh, another section that favorited something else, and I guess we can just version of this guy. And that was on the case studies. Reusable components. I'm not sure if they. Well, I mean my branch, so probably it's not gonna compile. Mm -mm -mm. Case studies. Again, I want. I just want to show this one because I know they have shown the downloading, which is it's really similar. Uh, but what I wanted to show you was they have this this favorite component and as you can see to favorite you have a state and your state is generic over the ID that you want to favorite and you basically have what makes a favorite which is like okay so you have a, a flag to know if it's already favorited or not you have the the error in case that doing the action failed and then you have the actions themselves to well just reload then why it's taking so long then you have the actions, like the button, basically the, the start that you click to favorite. And if there is an error, the analysis shows so you can dismiss it. And basically the action that comes from the API with the data. And here is the, the environment. Basically, you need to tell this component how to make the request to change the favorite state on your backend or your database or whatever, uh, which is quite nice because it's super flexible. Like it allows you to Imagine that each object that you want to favorite needs a different API, so you can easily plug it in there. And then you have the reducer that takes care of all these things, and then you have basically a favorite button. So this button is basically the star that takes care of it. So you can get this star on your UI, and you can put it anywhere you want, and you just attach it with the data that it needs, and now that star, that button on the UI is going to take care of favoriting whatever you want there. That's basically one of the most flexible and, and nice way of writing components that I've seen so far, to be honest. So they had these episodes that, uh, that they make, and then I added this language, which is a completely different type with a completely different actions, environments, reducer, completely separate thing. So two completely separate domains, languages and episodes. And then what you do is 
you have your episodes and you have your languages. And where is it? Do, 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 do. So that, those are the views themselves. Yeah, here at this point. So you have your episode, you have your language, and uh, and when you make the reducer, wait. here, I, you have this, I'm not finding now what I do it. But I probably broke this at some point because this is my fork, so I don't really know. I don't really know where this is. Yeah, basically, basically you pass the IDs on the language row. I think you on the row you have the favorite button. Yeah. So basically, you make your row for your language, and that's your your own thing. But then it's like, okay, I just use this favorite button, and boom, I can favorite for free. You just need to take care of giving to this component the data it needs. Like, of course, like you need to give it the like the data for the favorite, and 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 before this, you need to give it the the environment to know how to make the request. You know, but all the logic, all the handling. Imagine that you want to implement something like a, like a, an optimistic UI, all that stuff, you can just make a reusable component and use it everywhere you want. So that's that's one of the examples I wanted to show you because they are showing here a similar thing. And I'm sure they have something else, something else here. But, but yeah, I think that's it. I think that's it. We have seen a bunch of different things. Uh, so unless you guys have more questions, it's been like two hours of streaming. The internet has been working okay. So unless there is any question that I can answer right now, we're probably just gonna just gonna close this, make some dinner, and enjoy the weekend. And I'm probably gonna continue at some point with this application because it's an application I want to have. <laughs> because yeah, I have the CLI script now doing it, but I want I want the scenes. That's probably the next thing that we can do. I show you how we can open another screen, modify the state from that one, and automatically get it back into the main one. All that stuff. It's it's really nice to use. But yeah, I wanted to basically show a little the fancy things to hype a bit a little bit more people about it. Okay, that's it. That's it for today. We have taken a look at the the architecture and we have improved a little bit the application we're doing. Probably we'll continue next. If not we can continue also with the with the color picker that I was building like in these last few days. So we have these two things going on at the same time. And I think it's time to close this. Okay. So yeah. Thank you very much for watching. And thank you if you're watching this on, on YouTube later. And that's it. See you next time.